Hi, I'm attorney Gregory Dell, joined by attorney Cesar Gavidia, and we're going to talk about a case against the Standard Disability Insurance Company, and this is a resolved case that Cesar handled on behalf of one of our clients. And Cesar, in these cases, we always talk about um, the background of the case, what type of disability the claimant had, their occupation. Uh, in this particular case, it was a denial, why they were denied, and then what you were able to do for the client. And then lastly, provide some tips for the person who's watching this video that could possibly help them with their standard claim in the future. So give us the background information on this claim against the standard. So our client here was actually um, considerably young uh, for a disabled uh, person or disabled claimant. Uh, but once we kind of get into uh, what was causing his disability, you'd know why. So he, uh, he became disabled at 43. He was a senior network engineer, uh, IT administrator. So uh, he was working for the University of Utah. So if you, if you imagine a massive university and working on their computer systems, on their computer networks, probably going from building to building, you know, some buildings, several stories. I mean, it's, it's a pretty physical job. People think, oh, he works on computers. He's just sitting down all day. But, you know, he's going in between different areas and buildings. And, you know, when it comes to networking, it's also systems go down, you know, uh, routers, modems, cables. I mean, all of this stuff is kind of in his purview of, of responsibilities and duties. Uh, but he'd actually developed a cervical issue, a disorder. Uh, cervical spine disorder, went through three surgeries in his spine to correct the issues, um, and all three failed, basically continued having pain. And that's not really an uncommon thing. It's called, you know, failed back syndrome or failed spine syndrome. And it's, it's something that occurs after a spinal surgery uh, where, you know, sometimes other levels can get worse. The problem area doesn't get better. You continue to have pain. You, your pain may even get worse. Uh, your symptoms may even get worse. You may start having uh, radiculopathy into your hands, into your arms. Um, and for this 43-year-old uh, professional, that's exactly what happened. So was he ever paid benefits at any time? So um, he's actually working through all this. So that kind of just tells you um, how, um, how badly he wanted to just continue to work. So even after these surgeries, he'd continued working. He ended up having an ac a car accident. He was in a motor vehicle accident after a all those surgeries, and uh, at that, you know, re aggravated his condition, exacerbated the, the, the areas of his spine where he had those surgeries, also tore his shoulder, uh, had to have surgery for his shoulder to repair his shoulder, um, and it was at this point that he filed for his disability claim. Uh, Standard reviewed it. They found, you know, he was disabled for some period of time, but not beyond the 180-day waiting period, and if you're familiar with these group disability policies that are often issued as an employee benefit. There's a minimum period of time that you basically have to be totally disabled uh, in order to begin receiving long-term disability benefits. Now, you know, for most people, perhaps, that's not an issue. They might be dealing with a very uh, short-term or acute issue that's resolved within 180 days. Maybe their short-term disability is able to cover that period of time to replace their income while they're, you know, rehabilitating or, or getting better from that, that condition. But um, in this case, that wasn't what happened. I mean, he continued to have the, these problems and these functional, this functional impairment, wasn't able to return to work, but Standard sends him a letter stating, we reviewed your records and it doesn't appear that you're going to uh, need these benefits or that you're gonna be disabled beyond the 180 day period. So how detailed was the letter sent by Standard and it, what, what it, was the basis for the denial? That was really the surprise because um, typically when I when I see a Standard denial letter it's several pages. I mean I've seen Standard denial letters that were beyond 10 pages long right. um, and you would think with this particular person's medical history, with this client's medical history, you would see that. But it was about a page long it was a couple of paragraphs basically saying, this is what we did. We reviewed your records. It didn't say who reviewed the records. It didn't say we had this uh, neurologist or physiatrist or orthopedist or occupational specialist review your records. It just said, we reviewed your medical, review, your medical records. We reviewed the attendant physician statements. We don't believe you're going to be eligible for benefits or you're going to be disabled beyond, I think they picked whatever the date was that was 100, the 180-day deadline. 
and uh, said, if you don't agree with this or if you believe we're wrong, you know, respond to us through an appeal within 180 days. First of all, the facts you gave, it was shocking that they even denied him. It wasn't like a typical sedentary type job, so it had physical. It sounds like this was a, we need to make a decision on this claim. We don't know what to do, so we're going to deny it, which is really not necessarily the norm for the standard, but it sounds like they really dropped the ball on this one. I would say that, yeah. And, and then the other thing is, is that this was a University of Utah policy, which is a public university, so this was also exempt from ERISA. Right. which we've talked about the difference between an ERISA group policy versus an individual disability policy. So maybe Standard didn't feel any kind of regulation to write a more detailed explanation as to their basis for denying the letter, knowing that this particular claimant maybe didn't have to do an appeal and could have just sued them right away. And then they figured, we'll delay this for 18 months and work it out later. But what course of action did you take in light of getting the denial letter? Well, yeah, I mean, you brought up an interesting point, and we've, we've sued Standard many times um, in state and federal courts. Um, we've deposed their claims people. Um, it's, it's kind of unique in the sense that there are some, peop some claims examiners at Standard that are actually lawyers, um, and they're the ones that are doing this, these reviews. And you'll see that very often in these non- these, what we call you know, private disability claims or, or cases where state law governs the disability claims, not so much on the employee benefit side. This University of Utah policy you mentioned was you know, is a, an ERISA exempt policy. It's not handled through, it, well, I should say, it typically wouldn't be handled through the same protocol that would be handled, that you'd be handling a, a private company's employee benefit disability plan with. You, know. you don't have to stay sto so um, in line with the regulations that are ERISA. But in this case, they still gave him 180 days to respond. That's not unusual. But I think you're right. Perhaps they saw that this, uh, you know, we don't have to be as um, formal here. We don't have to stay so in line with the ERISA regulations. Let's just, you know, throw this out there. Maybe he's young. Maybe he'll go back to work. Maybe he won't respond. Maybe he won't appeal. But, I mean, we're talking a very, about a guy, a young guy, with very serious problems, with very serious level, levels of impairment that he could not return to work and, and perform his duties really in, any, in, any, in really any effective manner at all. And I know when the claim came in, we discussed it and we basically said, look, I think we can get some additional evidence here and convince the standard, which we've done many times in the past, to reverse their denial. And so what did you actually do as a plan of attack to win this appeal? So even though there wasn't a lot of detail in terms of why they were denying the disability claim, I thought it was important that we still approach this appeal as if they threw everything at it, okay? And the reason that's important is that, you know, he's already gone now almost 180 days without any benefit payments. If we don't do this right, he could potentially go another 180 days, year, two years without any money coming in. So I thought it was important to see where kind of the, the areas we can improve are Functional capacity examination was critical. That's why we went and, and obtained one. I thought that also would give his doctors the confidence to say, look, he may be young, but this is what we know his functional impairments to be. A lot of doctors will really be very hesitant, especially with a younger claimant, to say they can't function, they can't work, they have this level of impairment, he can't lift 10 pounds. But when the doctors, his doctors review the functional capacity report that we submitted to them, they saw right there in the raw data and the objective proof and evidence that he was going to have trouble, that he's having trouble lifting 10 pounds. He, was, he couldn't do a lot of these things that uh, would be required of his job. And I know it was important that you clarified for his treating doctors that this is not about his activities of daily living. This isn't about his ability to dress himself, bathe himself, toilet himself, get out of, in and out of bed. This is about his ability to commit to an employer eight hours a day, five days a week, and to be able to operate at the same level that he was operating before, which was a very technical, very demanding job. And so when you're able to clarify that for doctors who don't often understand the thresholds for what's needed in order to get approved long-term disability benefits, that's when the pieces come together. And that's how you're able to do a custom attending physician statement and get the doctors to basically sign off to say that he can't do any occupation that's gonna require him to commit to a schedule, you know, sit, stand, walk, do any of those things with any kind of reasonable continuity for more than eight hours a day, 
And I expect him to also, when he's in pain or has discomfort, to have cognitive difficulties in the sense of difficulty focusing, being distracted by the pain, having trouble multitasking, remembering you know, different schedules, especially networking engineering is so technical. Right. You know, there's so many things going Intellectually on. Intellectually and physically demanding. Yeah. And yeah. so anyone who knows, even someone who gets a simple headache, try to go focus, try to even read when you have a headache. So let alone this person being at the computer, having to do all the things that are required of a network engineer was almost impossible. So how long did it take after you submitted your appeal? It was actually a, a pretty quick turnaround. It took about a month or two uh, for them to respond and say, we're approving it. He's continued to be paid, which is good. We're beyond the 24 month own occupation uh, period. I think the, the functional capacity exam and, and what it showed there really showed he'd been, he was disabled from any occupation from the onset. Um, so it wasn't so much of a, of, of a challenge to get over that hump. And I know when you were doing the appeal, since he had never been paid, it wasn't about let's just get him through the own occupation definition of disability, which would have been unable to perform the material and substantial duties of his occupation for 24 months, and then switches to unable to perform any gainful occupation, that our strategy was let's do this all at once. So when we win this thing, we're already into it, say, give or take six to nine months, because he had the six-month elimination period, you did the appeal and then it took them and you know more time let's set it up so that when he gets to the 24 month mark they don't deny him again and say oh by the way we think now you could be a librarian and run the computers for them or something right. like that and so you did get past that because it's been over the 24 month mark and now you continue to monitor his claim on a monthly basis and make sure his benefits are protected moving forward so um, congratulations on that claim and i'm sure the client's happy this eases the the pressure off of him, at least financially, and I know that you're monitoring the claim on a monthly basis to make sure whatever's needed for standard to continue to prove his eligibility is delivered to them. So if you're someone with a standard long-term disability insurance claim, feel free to reach out to Caesar, myself. No matter where you live in the country, we're available to assist you. We would like to immediately provide you with a free phone consultation, so go ahead and give us a call to discuss your claim, and whenever you need us, we'll be here to discuss your claim. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gregory Dell, the managing attorney of Dell Disability Lawyers, and I hope you find the video you just watched helpful. We put these videos out all of the time, and we'd love if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel. Beyond our videos on our YouTube channel, we also have lots of information available on our website at diattorney.com, and we encourage you to come to our website. The goal is, is that we want you to be educated about the disability insurance process. And when you get to our website, you'll see that we have information all about your specific disability insurance company, your occupation, and your medical condition. And we've designed our website such that you can easily search our website to find things that you may specifically be looking for. Now at our website, we have thousands and thousands of pages of information, hundreds of videos that you can search. Plus, we're building a section of reviews of all the disability insurance companies, and we have the Ask Our Lawyer section where you can go ahead and ask us any questions that you may have. Now, we realize that you may not need us right now, but you may need us in the future to help you with your disability claim, and we think one of the best ways to keep in touch is by clicking the button below and subscribing to our channel. And most importantly, again, no matter where you live in the country, we're always available. Just go ahead and give us a call. We're happy to discuss your claim and let you know immediately if we can help you.